Great, all right. My name is Mary Ann Cairns. I'm a postdoc here at SARI. You're in the session focused on environmental contaminants and preterm birth. Today we're actually going to hear from Shoba Srinivasan first, followed by Akram Al Shawabke and Carmen Milagros Velis. Um, please note that Shoba will speak for 10 minutes at the beginning as well as 10 minutes at the end of the session. And we're gonna go ahead and hold all questions to the end. So please just write down any questions you might have and we'll be happy to take those afterwards. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure we are going to hit that slug, right? Very soon, after lunch, Phil is saying no. Uh, but thank you, Phil, very much for inviting me. I asked him when uh, he invited me why he was doing that, and I'm sure he's going to regret it today. Uh, because typically, I was supposed to be the third speaker. Guess what? I became the first and the third, fourth speaker. So, you know, ask a so sociologist to be a speaker at a meeting, and they will change it all. <laughs> so, we're going to do it this way. So what I'm really going to do is kind of give you a perspective that everybody's been talking about today all morning, but it hasn't really laid out a theoretical perspective for you. So I'm just going to give it, for, give it to you there because you all know it, but this bears reminding for where we come from. So what is our lens? It's a perspective. It's not a relativism. So in real estate, you know the phrase, right? Location, location, location. So whether you buy this island off of Florida or you're at St. Mark's Square in Florence, the value of your house is going to go up dramatically depending on your location. So it's very important when you own a house to determine the location. But in our research, our lens is context, context, context. It's the community in which people live. And the community in which our people live are the homeless, our children, who are not really laborers, but are, are put to work in families because of dire poverty at a very young age to help in the household. I'm sure even across America, if you ever go down, nowadays, of course, we have homes that cost five million go this way, 100,000 go that way. We don't believe in segregation, of course. But if you do cross the street, which I did in Lawrence, I went to Lawrence yesterday, went to Lawrence on one side, and what do we have on the other side of the tracks? Andover. So Andover is one of the richest communities, but if people from Andover crossed over to Lawrence and saw how people live there, we might give them a different perspective in life. Anyway, for the gentleman who is from Canada, I have borrowed this from Canada. So we have a very biomedical approach in our sciences. The, the health gradient is a very individually based health gradient. This poor guy has to lumber up the hill, ignoring everything else, and he's fighting not only environmental health hazards, but he's looking at lack of education, inadequate food, unemployment, housing, and poverty. So for a large part, the focus is on the individual and not on the social determinants, that which guide us. So we, at at least where I work, which is at the National Cancer Institute in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences, is we look at the social determinants of health a lot in the work that we do. These are, of course, the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, including the health system. They are for a large part influenced by policy. We do a lot of work on tobacco policy and we don't quibble about it. We tell Congress that we do it. We tell NIH that we do it. It is very important because we are fighting industry here. Until and unless we can have good policies, we're never going to be able to fight industry on that. And we know most of these social determinants are unfair and avoidable factors. These are not predetermined. So most of our focus at NIH much to the chagrin of most of the people in this room, is on individual level. It is the biology of everything, the genetics, the behavior, the individual insurance, language barriers, culture, pre prejudice, stress, race, ethnicity, which is another issue, sex, LGBT, all those issues at a very individual level. 
What we do ignore for the large part is policies on insurance coverage, access to care, access to quality care, utilization of care, cultural competency, language barriers, poverty, homelessness, and somebody brought up discrimination and racism, which is a very, very big factor when you go for treatment, at least for cancer. So beyond the individual into the realm of policy. So here we go. We know all this, but we never apply it when we do most of our research. This is, a, this is 2005, data from 2005, percent of people in different racial or ethnic groups living in poor neighborhoods. It is Native American Indians and Alaska Natives, Blacks, Hispanics that largely live in very poor neighborhoods. Why is that important to us? Poverty, for me, is linked to cancer mortality. And at a very high odds ratio, look at that, breast cancer and prostate cancer. Simple, I just picked out two. So we had this study, and NIEHS was part of that, and uh, it was a, called the Centers for Population Health and Health Disparities, where they looked at stress, social isolation, in, in neighborhoods which had very, very high crime and very, very high poverty. They found that 67% of the women's cortisol levels were flatliners. A flatliner is usually somebody who has so much vigilance that any time of the day there are no variations in their cortisol level, leading to not cancer, but tumor growth. And this has been tested out in rats and in mice. And they did the study in clearing, which is, it's a very small picture that you see there of clearing, which is like a rectangle there and uh, Englewood, which is on the other side. And look at this. We have a high rates of poverty in Englewood. Look at the median household income. It's lower than the American median, right? Which is 24K, by the way, poverty. Homicides, robberies. So Sarah Gellert, who actually, that's the quote from her, she says Rela relaxation might help a woman biologically, but she'll probably get murdered. So in cancer, it's very important, but we see this across the world. If you look at the Equality Trust, this is uh, work done by Wilkinson and Pickett. I'm sure you all heard about the Equality Trust. Look where US is on this one. It's out of the chart, right? I had to shrink everything to put US in it. So you look at life expectancy, maths, literacy, infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, teenage births, trust, obesity, mental illness, social mobility. In all of it, US does the worst compared to all these countries. And social mobility, that which we believe most in America. What does America promise us? The American dream, right? What is the American dream? That you'll all get a great job and great house and, you know, you'll have a great education. You know, what is the rate of a kid who grows up in an inner city, poverty-ridden neighborhood to ever rise out? Take a wild guess. What is the percentage that ever rises out of that? It's at three. But if that kid moves at the age of 16 from an inner city to a suburb which has a good school system with a graduation rate at 100%, guess how many life years you add to that kid? Take a wild guess. It's amazing. 17 years. What are you doing when you're 16 years old? You're deciding on college. You suddenly change this kid's life completely. So here, so we are trying to close this gap. It's not that we don't know all these things. We know it very well. That you know, we need to look at poverty. We need to have better education systems. We need to have better healthcare systems. But there's a true disconnect when we try to deliver it. So we like a model, the social ecological model, right? Which goes from basic science to social conditions or social conditions to basic science, which we will see, which we really think interact with each other. It's not one or the other. It's how they affect and in interact across the life course. Am I doing okay on time? I can go on and on. Oh, I've got two minutes. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Okay, so we want to look at these issues not alone by themselves, but we want to see how they interact with each other and affect outcomes across the life course, not at one point in time. So Massey, of course, turned it on its head for us. He said, 
Oh, it is socioeconomic inequality, residential segregation that leads to coronary heart disease, inflammatory disorders, and cognitive impairment. It's not that because you have a mental health condition, you're poor. It is your poor, so you have a mental health condition. Let's turn it on its head, finally. So what we're going to hear today is an example of that, where they're going to talk about the Puerto Rico test site for exploring contamination threats. So Millie is go, actually, I turned this around. I seem to have made a mistake. Akram is actually going to talk first. I'm very sorry. Somehow, something went wrong with my slides here. Going, he's going to talk about community involvement in water quality measurements and what are the lessons learned, followed by Millie, who's going to talk about the community engagement core. But before they, I bring them out here, just to give us a little bit of a geography lesson. I always like to do that. I'm not trying to kind of be patronizing about it, but it always is good to give a context. I am, after all, talking about context. So you see that little red there? That's where Puerto Rico is. It's not off of New York. A lot of people think Puerto, because there are a lot of Puerto Ricans in New York, they think it's off of New York. Somebody actually said, you know, from, from New York, Puerto Rico is very easy. And I'm like, OK. So is the rest of the Caribbean. But then that's OK. Whatever. So this is Puerto Rico for you. But here is the demographics. There are 8.3 million Puerto Ricans. Only 47% live in Puerto Rico. 22% have a bachelor's degree versus mainland Hispanics of 13%. The median income in Puerto Rico is 14,400, so which is lower than the American poverty level, which is at 23K. And, but the mainland Hispanics earn about 20. The poverty, four out of 10 are below poverty level in Puerto Rico. And mainland, 24% of Hispanics are below poverty. So we have a higher educated community, low income, high poverty. Now you would never think to put those three together, right? That reminds me, actually, if you haven't read Matt Tybee's book, go get it and read it. He puts three things together. He says, America has had the greatest income gap, highest level of earnings, highest level of incarceration. Go put it together. And that book explains it. What have we done in the US to our low income underserved populations? How we have militarized the police? How we have incarcerated people for standing outside buildings? Every time I approach a building and I'm standing outside of it and making a call, I wonder whether I'm going to be stopped. I always wonder, who is the person who's going to come and ask me whether I'm in the right place or not? I rush in, just in case. You never know. But here goes the leading cause of death. So I just pulled out some of the leading causes of death, which are really related to stressors in, in in uh, social stressors, malignant neoplasms, diseases of the heart, cerebr cerebrovascular diseases, chronic lower respiratory diseases, influenza pneumonia, certain conditions or originating during the prenatal period, hypertension, hypertensive renal diseases. In all of it, it's higher in Puerto Rico. And that is the context in which both Akram and Millie are doing their work. So I invite them to come and talk to us today. Bring up your slide, Akram. Okay. Thank you, Shovan. Thank you, Marianne. That's a, a wonderful introduction. I also want to thank Phil and the organizing committee. It's been a great event. It's been wonderful uh, being here this morning and listening to all the talks. And now I would like to follow up on this conversation about Puerto Rico. We started working in Puerto Rico about seven years. We started our center about five years ago in 2010, working with Jose uh, and uh, a large group over there looking into contamination and its uh, potential contribution to preterm birth. And it was, a, again, a problem that's driven by community concerns over there. You could see there are a lot of concerns in Puerto Rico, but this one was really gaining a lot of attention at that time, and, and we were um, uh, uh, able to put some work together uh, 
in that area. So I have Jose Ingrid Badia. She could not join us today. She is a hydrologist, and she's the one who's actually doing the water sampling and acid. I will be talking about, of course, Carmen Milley will be talking in a few minutes and working with Phil, of course, uh, leading with Carmen our community engagement core. So what I'll do is uh, give first an overview about the center, what, we, what we're doing, what's our motivation, talking about preterm birth, and then a little bit more about the uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, then talk about our approach, and uh, the, since again we're talking about the social, uh, the community engagement aspect of, of things, I'm going to talk about uh, the water sampling that Ingrid did and some of the experience that we've gained from that. I'm finished with the, some uh, concluding remarks and acknowledgments. Um, so our center is funded by the SRP program of the National Institute of Health, uh, started in 2010. And it's one, I, I guess, of a few pro uh, um, opportunities where you can have, which requires uh, researchers from different disciplines to, to work together. It's a requirement to be successful. And um, it really was a wonderful opportunity to put this work together and to work on it because of, number one, the impacts. We, we, you can have significant impact on the community, and you could see that by working with uh, uh, scientists and engineers from, from different disciplines. Um, our group includes Northeast University, University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, and, and San Juan campus is a medical campus. We also have uh, University of Michigan, West Virginia University, Silent Spring Institute, and EarthSoft. Uh, which helping us with the data. So we look at the source to outcome approach. We try to look into the problem, collect all the data at different scales up to from um, source to outcome. Uh, we design our uh, uh, center around that idea to allow us to maximize uh, understanding not only contamination problem, but also the other factors that we talked about today. We have diverse expertise. We really have it's just learning the language from different disciplines been great. It's challenging at the beginning, but you know you have to be patient and, and, and listen, and you get uh, uh, the ability to do a lot if we're able to break that barrier between the different disciplines. So pre-term Puerto Rico, right now it's around 17% actually less in the recent report, so it, it, was, it dropped, which is great news. It was, at the, when we started, close to 20%. There's a lot of progress in, in improving and reducing the rate of preterm birth, but it's still very high. In the U.S., it's around 11.5%. Uh, right now, it used to be 12 And with a lot of work, different organizations, including March of Dimes, uh, the, there has been a significant reduction in the preterm birth rates. The cost is significant. There are many. The, the preterm birth, it's, it has a lot of impact on, on the community, and I have listed what that means. Um, but I did not list over there talking about the cost, the, the, the emotional and financial burden that this will have on the uh, our children as they grow up and, the, and their families. And working with Jose really um, kind of opened our eyes to a lot of the things, the challenges beyond just the, 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 the delivery itself. Um, known when we started working with Jose about seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, they were looking at what are the factors that contribute to the, this high rate, and none of them would explain this increase in, in Puerto Rico. So we tried to make a case uh, and link it to, pre uh, to environmental contamination, which is significant. Um, we did a lot of investigations at the beginning, um, and um, having more than 200 hazardous waste sites in Puerto Rico, 16 of them on the national priority list, and talking to many over there, including the EPA, Caribbean divisions, they can tell you that many of the other sites can be listed on the Superfund list. So there, is, there are more contamination than just the 16 uh, sites that they have uh, uh, on the list. One of the challenges they face living, especially in the North Coast, is that they have this geology. It's called karst geology, which is not unusual, but uh, it's very, uh, it's different. You have a limestone rock where the groundwater goes into these big channels, big caves that are formed. It does not have that soil, sand, clay media that gives the filtration effect. Over here, the channels go without any filtration. And that, these are some pictures from field studies from field trips that uh, our group had uh, Puerto Rico and showing in the uh, that corner, you can see a well 
uh, into the into a cast aquifer. Uh, so this was a different kind of media, different kind of aquifer. The exposure is not fully understood. Not much in the literature explaining um, how contamination move into this kind of uh, geology. Uh, although it is, there's a lot of karst aquifers uh, in the U.S. And, and worldwide. So we made this case, and we started looking into the contribution of environmental contamination to pretend birth. We want to see, uh, investigate that question. Uh, we want to see how much this karst geology exposure through karst groundwater is, is a factor. And we want to develop solutions to and, and low-cost solutions, things that are sustainable, easily implemented to provide cleaner water and also through the community engagement to provide some more, some more awareness over there. And I want to emphasize over here in the first few bullets, you know, talking about uh, today, not only lo looking at the problem from one angle only, I mean, in this case, through the Superfund program, we're focusing on environmental contamination, contaminants that come in from Superfund sites. But we adopted an approach that will allow us to collect a lot of data to look at it from a total point, exposure point of view. So we can collect a lot of information, not only contamination, but many of the other variables that Kathy, Gwen, and others talked about today, that you have to look at the big picture when you're trying to look into environmental exposure and, and, and health impacts. A map of Puerto Rico showing the area where we study the north coast, mostly karst aquifers, a lot of uh, karst groundwater, major source over there. Uh, many superfund sites in that area, there's a, a, a good number of superfund sites. Some of them are closed, but they have, I think, about maybe 10 that are still active superfund sites. So this is our approach, and do a quick slide showing how we look at it from an interdisciplinary point of view. We have five projects. And uh, these five projects range from uh, a targeted epidemiology, a toxicology project, non-targeted uh, epidemiology or chemical analysis. We have phaeton transport project that looks into contaminants, how they move and exposure happens. And we have a remediation project where uh, um, we try to develop uh, uh, cost-effective ways for clean water. But I think not only that we have these different projects from different disciplines, but our approach is that we have a centralized core we call it the human subject core that's led by Jose in Puerto Rico that reaches out and that does the recruitment for the participants that we need for this study because we're trying to uh, track about 1,800 women at the end of the study uh, and go through the, the, uh, the pregnancy, pregnancy, collect samples and data uh, to allow us to, to do the analysis that we want. So through this core, we collect data and information and samples from source to outcome. So we have the environmental scientists, we have the biomedical scientists collecting the relevant information, historical data, as well as the samples that are needed to develop the overall complete picture that we need to, to do the analysis. Uh, and then these projects, once they do the analysis, they all come back and feed into a centralized database. So the the samples, the data are indexed from the beginning, so when they go back into the data core, that allow us to link the information that we collect from different projects, and that allows the integration of looking at the bigger picture. An important component is, of course, the community engagement. And uh, the interesting part about the community engagement is that when we started the center, we did not have a community engagement core. It was not required at that time. But when we got into the program, we realized actually how important it was because our recruitment, reaching out, working with the community needed that component that was missing. We didn't have the social scientists that allow us to do that. Then it was the program changed the requirements, and they said, you need to have a community engagement core. And we were lucky because it was really a good thing to do to help us achieve the, 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 the connection that we need. So Jose introduced us to Millie Carmen, which she, uh, she will talk about uh, 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 her work in, in a few minutes. And then Phil joined us from Brown University, and we were excited about that because his timing was perfect for, for continuing to work with us on, on, on this project. And that helped us address the social, uh, uh, the community aspect of the work we do. As part of the study, so we have to recruit, at the end, about, again, 1,800 women that are uh, ex expecting, collect a lot of data, until delivery, which is a process uh, that Jose is leading in, in, in Puerto Rico. And uh, this involves a lot of interactions with the community. And that's what Millie will talk about. Uh, 
but we collect a lot of information beyond just only the environmental contamination, environmental exposure that is relevant to the scope of work we do, again, to be able to do the analysis that is needed at the end. One uh, factor where we needed to um, have a better connection with the community is when we did the recruitment, right now uh, at the end of 2014, we had um, more than 800 women uh, part of the study. S good number of pregnancies were completed and, 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 and outcomes we were looking at, but the withdrawal rate was 173. And when we started at the beginning, we had a very high withdrawal rate, about more than 30% or 35%. But learning more about the community, understanding how they react, for example, that you would enroll a woman and then she will agree, but then she goes home and her husband says, no, you should not do that, and then they withdraw. They are in the system now, so we withdraw, so you lose that. So that's something that's simple, we didn't know, but that connection with the community allow us to learn more about. Another example is that working with the clinics. The clinics, the nurses who do the recruitment for us, had a stronger connection with the patient, with the women who come and visit, and through them, we were able to identify the ones who most likely to stay and to continue the study and, and focus on that. So this is, again, a component that improved our retention and decreased the rate of withdrawal from, uh, from the study. We collect a lot of information. As I mentioned over here in this slide, you have uh, diet information, medical records. We collect uh, uh, socioeconomic data. Uh, we, we we have very ex product use questionnaires. We have extensive data that we collect from these women, and uh, all these index so that allow us to do again the overall exposure at the end. This is an example of some of the results that we have. We look at this one talking about, for example, the age, marital status, uh, uh, education, household income, employment. Some some of the variables that we look. We also have the data about nutrition, as I mentioned, and and many other uh, information, close to 3,000 data points per participant. So that is significant. So what we do with that is that through the project, we take that data and we have a centralized database. We have a computer scientist who build that data for us. Everything is indexed coming from different projects, and then that data is available to our scientists to look at it, not only from an environmental point of view, but again, looking to all these variables together. And we're building this information, building that database to do the extensive analysis. This is an example, for example, showing, as I mentioned in the morning, that uh, export phthalate concentrations in, in samples collected from uh, uh, women in Puerto Rico were higher than those in the US. And then maybe do some analysis and some association. So our goal is to continue to build this data to go beyond just environmental, but also the other socioeconomic factors and, and other variables uh, to get a complete picture. So this is an example of some of the results we're working on. We also look into exposure to understanding how much contaminant is there, and then develop models that look into the history of contamination within that area. So we can predict fate and transport of these contaminants and how much exposure has happened over time over the past few decades. So the, 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 the database that we have will allow us to do both map the contamination or, or chemical spread in the area as well as develop uh, quantitative mathematical models to tell us how was the history of contamination in the area. So one of the things that we need in order to develop that information is to get an idea about how much of the chemicals we're targeting are there. We need to collect samples, and we need to go and reach out to see the community and the entities on the island to be able to collect as much historical data about contamination in, 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 in the study area. Ingrid is leading project four, which is, again, the project that looks into how does the contaminant move into ground, uh, in groundwater, and the karst geology. She has a group of students who are really the ones uh, doing the work over there with the community. So the, the, the stuff that I'm, the, the, the information I'm presenting right now is from Ingrid Piri. And again, I'm sorry that she could not join us, um, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about the things that she's doing. So we need historical data, so we need to go five minutes. We need to go to EPA, USGS, and other uh, um, entities in, on the island and collect those historical data about the contamination that they've had at Superfund sites and, and groundwater. And then we need to go, as for part of the project, to go and collect groundwater samples 
from different locations to do the analysis. So, for example, we have to collect ground collect groundwater samples from domestic wells, public wells, industrial wells, agriculture, so brass brass over here. That's the water authority. And different entities, we would like to collect the samples so that we analyze them and get a better picture of what's going on. We will also collect some tap water samples from the residents of these houses. So all the, if we go to the wells, all of them except springs and maybe caves require authorization, coordination, and connection with the community, industry, or the government that is over, over there. And this, it, so it, it becomes a process. And actually, when we started that, we you know, I'm an engineer, she's a hydrologist, we write, we were going to go and collect groundwater samples, and that's about it. You don't think about the challenges that are over there to, to be able to do that, and you don't think that, hey, I need Millie, I need Phil to be able to build that relationship and have that uh, success in collecting the samples, and that's something that we, we learn throughout the process. So the data, most of it, the historical ones are in paper form, and talking about going to and collecting those papers, they, they sit and they're not used, and we, we, we have to go through a process to have those papers and then scan them and enter them in electronic form and then share them back with the, the source. So kind of a bi-directional relationship is that we benefit from it, but at the same time we provide it to them in a form that is uh, helpful to them in the future. So this is one of the aspects that we we worked with uh, with the local agencies over there, and the response about sharing data varies depending on on uh, who we are working with over there. But again, it's different entities that we will be looking at. We had some success in uh, looking into collecting that data and being able to assess the uh, history, water quality variations, open this bidirectional relationship with these entities bringing the big data issue within our conversation, developing some ways to work with them together. But the challenge is uh, the, the data is highly variable because collections is from different sources, the mechanisms are different, you need to clean that data and make sure it's all consistent at the end. It requires some, uh, some coordination at the end, very specially and important. It's a technical challenge. Uh, uh, then there's some other barriers that we had to, to work on uh, uh, to address the historical uh, data collection. We also do current field measurements. Those are, again, going to the site and collect samples, analyze them, and then share them with the community as well as share them with, with the uh, project to meet the, the scope of the research that we do. Uh, again, willingness to participate in, in order to go and collect samples and analyze them is highly variable. Most of the participants request that the data is not shared. So basically, they're, they're, at the beginning, some of them were very excited about collaboration and working with us, and then over time, they lose that excitement. It becomes a burden. There are other factors that, that are involved in, in it. The, some of it, actually, we have a table that shows, uh, I think the prepared discharge shows about the willingness, how it varies depending on what exactly we're looking for. Spring and caves, you can go and sample anytime, it's not a problem. Domestic well owners, they were willing to, to help us and work with us. non this is, a, this is the non, uh, the, it's a group of houses, 25 or more, that are not connected to the water authority, they're on their own, and this is their only water source. So for them, it's about having access to water, and for them, to, for us to go and analyze the samples, what will that eventually affect them? If there's contamination and that water source is, 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 is closed down, they have a problem. So there are some other issues. It's not only about just analyzing the water that will impact them, what we do eventually, and we have to be sensitive. And again, these are the type of things that would require working with the core, working the social scientists that we have to build that uh, understanding and to see how to approach it. Another thing that Ingrid mentioned to me is that you go and sample at a site. It's not that you come in Boston, you can go into and sample wherever you want, nobody will say anything. People will come to you and will say, what are you doing? So you have to build some relationship with them. You have to send the same people every time and have that connection so that when you go and sample, they know you, you're part of, of the process, they, they kind of have that relationship. You, you trust them, they trust you. 
and, and build on it. If someone else comes in, it, becomes, it, may, it may become an issue. Some of the examples that we have learned fr through this, I will skip, uh, I, I have to stop right now, so I will skip to um, the, the, the end in a way just wanted to show concluding remarks is that uh, it is essential to have the community involvement for us engineers and scientists who do research on environmental fate and transport and exposure. It's not that we go and this, do this study independent of the community itself. It's not about collecting samples and analyzing them and, and do the science like we do in the lab. So it emphasized for us the need to, to develop this plan and that's why in the past, Ingrid did not have that, we didn't have that connection, so right now we're working with the social scientists who are part of the community engagement core to help us facilitate the sample and data collection from the, the, the community over, over there and from the sites that we're looking at. Um, a lot of challenges we face, of course, but I would like to acknowledge the SRP program and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences for supporting the work we do through the PROTECT. We have a large group, I mentioned just a few names over there, and many of the agencies, Silent Spring Institute too, working with us uh, uh, in, in our current work. And I think next, Millie will tell you about the other side of this. So I talk about the environmental, she will tell you about more uh, the, the relationship with the women and the interactions with the community that we have established over there. Thank you. Excited and honored to be here. The presentations this morning were just incredible. I, I'm learning so much, and I feel very humbled to be among people that have worked for such a long time for environmental justice causes. And um, this is uh, the Puerto Rico Protege, and our environmental, um, our community engagement core. This is our team. It's just part of our team because every day we get new people. Um, that are part of our participants and the people that work with us at the clinics and in the community that um, want to be a part of it. Um, you already saw how, how much contamination we have, and that's only part of it. You know, Part of it is what is coming from the water, from the land, from the air. Puerto Rico has one of the highest rates of asthma in children. So we have lots and lots to worry about. This is, these are the areas where we are um, uh, recruiting. These are the clinics where we are working. And we have an interesting mix of um, participants. Some of them come from federally qualified health centers, locally community, local community clinics. Most of the people that, um, the participants that we recruit from there are people from very low socioeconomic um, uh, um, resources as are most of uh, our, the population in Puerto Rico. Some of them um, go to the private practice clinics, so we have also. And one thing that we have found is it, it doesn't matter you know, if you are from a lower social economic um, um, level or if, the, if you have the possibility of going to private services, they are all, 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 they are all exposed to the contaminants in this because we're living in the same spaces. So in that, in that sense, this is a problem of everyone. These are our um, um, main objective. We want to engage women participating in the centers so that we have a broader group of people here to study. Um, and this helps us enable key stake, st uh, stakeholders to offer lay perspectives and information. It, it builds trust with the affected communities. It improves study recruitment and retention rates, builds capacity for participants and their community organizations. It lays the groundwork for additional community-based participatory research projects, and you'll see that we already have some things, some ideas going. We hope to expand on existing collaborations, and, and we didn't start from zero. You know, we, the, the project did not have a, a community engagement core, but it had a human sampling core 
and they did a great job of, of becoming engaged with the participants. That is something that I cannot, we cannot say we got there, we started from scratch. We, there was a relationship and that helped us to be, to them to be open to um, our going into their homes and their clinics and their personal space. So I think there's a great um, um, credit to be given to uh, the people who began in that, uh, this project. We also hope to develop multi-directional mechanism with part part protect participants, both pregnant women and residents near the sampling sites so that we can communicate the findings. This is the first study in Puerto Rico that will return to the people that have participated, the information on what has gone going on. There is a long history in Puerto Rico of people doing research in communities and just getting out what they need and leaving. So there is a great deal of um, uh, a lack of confidence in academia, and I, I know that you all know what I'm talking about. And so in this sense, it's like, what? You know, it's, uh, some of them are like very surprised, and I'm sure that saying, well, what, what do they want if they're giving uh, uh, something back? But I think it's very important because it, in a sense, it will help um, many of these people become empowered and, 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 and so that they can change the reality of where they're living. Mm -hmm. We also hope in partnership with participants develop engagement, education, prevention, and advocacy activities that stem from the research findings, and we've already begun to do that. We can't do this alone, so we rely on our community partnerships. This is the only way. We don't want to just come in here, come here, report back, and leave. We want to really leave um, um, and continue to be engaged with this community and that they can and themselves create their own um, Collaboration. So we collaborate with March of Dimes, with the Puerto Rico Task Force for Prematurity. This is a, um, an organization that works um, with different hospitals trying to, to find out what is going on. What, what, why is this, these um, levels so high? We also work with the local community health centers. These centers are very willing to work with us because part of what they do is try to do prevention. This is probably the only um, space in, in, in the area of health, the only context where some prevention is being done. So we have nurses, we have health educators, social workers, um, trying to, uh, very um, uh, avid to have more information so that they can use um, uh, um, knowledge from the environmental health area to um, provide better education to the people that they work with, not only the um, pregnant women, but everyone that goes to these clinics. Mm. <clears throat> they also serve as um, very good um, key informants. So they, they help us look through the instruments that we're using to get information. They'll, they help us set up a good, um, um, good information so that we can do report back that is relevant and that people can use. We, all, we have established a community advisory board, and people that are from different um, uh, areas, including participants, are part of this collaborating board. And we um, present um, the information that, that we are, we, we meet with them, we, we give them information on what is going on in the project, and we also ask, ask for information from them. <clears throat> we have um, partnerships with local environmental advocacy groups. Puerto Rico has a long history of struggle against um, um, contamination. There's, there are many, many instances of um, a struggle that some have not been successful, but some have. We have a very big uh, success we had recently with a huge um, gas pipe that was going to be, was going, was going to go across the island, through the mountains, and um, through grassroots efforts, through these local environmental advocacy groups, we were, we were able to stop that. So um, that is, is important to us. There are other um, organizations like Codicam, the Citizens of the Karst, and, and that work for environmental um, uh, um, conservancy, but also environmental health. And they work with uh, local schools and local organizations providing information. So they are also our partners in this area. We are, have also people from the local maternal and child and women's health community-based organizations and human rights groups in Puerto Rico. There are a lot of, lot of violations to human rights in Puerto Rico, so we have lots of groups that are fighting and struggling with them. So you have a group called SEPARE. They're working to um, lower the levels of cesarean births in Puerto Rico. Some ho hospitals have 70% of cesarean births. 
So it's it's really a big problem, and these local CBOs are working to um, um, empower women so that they can um, fight against the violence that occurs in, in, in these cases. And we see it as violence. And they're also part of our partners. The Alianza de Autismo is a local parents group, and it's the biggest one in Puerto Rico. They work for advocacy in the area of children with, um, with autism. Puerto Rico has one of the highest um, um, rates of autism. It's much higher than here in the United States. So, And you know, they think that it has to do with environmental. There are, there are environmental concerns in that area. We have a collaborations also with local um, 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 higher education organizations. The, the, um, the University of Sacred Heart produced a, a short um, documentary that's, the, um, that's on YouTube. It's called 36 Semana, 36 Weeks. And it, it tells a story of, of uh, um, a, a mother that has a child in the, in the NICU, but it also talks about what Protect does and what we're trying to do and, and explains you know, the problem of prematurity in Puerto Rico and how it relates um, to um, contamination. <clears throat> we, all, we, we work with the community centers. We do, um, we go to the, because there's a, a, um, a very big um, a, a cultural thing about doing community fairs and lots of activities so that people go to the, to the center and sort of get information about their health. So we work with them and we provide information on the areas that we um, uh, are able to help. We also meet with them and provide the information from the project so that they can further their, their agendas. We've made very good connections with local political partners because, you know, we need them. We have two, um, uh, a, a senator and a, um, someone from the House of Representatives, both from, the, they are, belong to um, uh, committees that have to do with education and, and early childhood. And they help us champion our efforts and help us, you know, um, go perhaps to places where we where, will be harder for us to. And, and, they, and they will be needed at the time when we have, we need to voice out the concerns of these communities, so. <clears throat> We've been producing um, educational materials, and th in this, I must say that we have had great um, uh, collaboration from our training core. All right, the trainees in Protect come from all the different projects. So some of these students come from environmental health, engineering, and, and all of them have been interested in doing some community engagement work, which is really interesting. So we have them doing different pamphlets and information, um, and some of them help us with the interviews. We have students from the, um, um, what we call the hard sciences, doing qualitative interviews and analysis so that they, that in a sense, it's sort of like a transdisciplinary um, arena. We've been, um, uh, played a part in, in with uh, the EPA in Puerto Rico, the Region 2 Caribbean Science Workshop. This year we were able to um, be part of the, um, uh, Organizing Committee, Dr. Ingrid Padilla, whom Akram was speaking about earlier. She was a big part of this, and she um, brought us there so that we can learn. And something that was great about this experience is that we got there and we learned that Puerto Rico is one of the places where there are more, there are more um, volunteers doing um, um, environmental science uh, work. So that gave us a, a, a better perspective and, and, and high hope so that, that we can do some of that work in the area of environmental health as well. And we also have Dr. Brown as part of the discussion with Region 1 and, and, and 2 and community involvement and, and managers of the Region 1 and the two SRPs to discuss ways for better collaboration between the SRP centers and Superfund community involvement staff and ideas for possible partners and technical assistance. And this is Ingrid. We were we we, we hosted the lunch at that conference. So you know we we the 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 thing was that we had, we had to do a lunch that had the less amount of waste possible. So she was real good getting boxed water and. We would give you a sandwich with a little napkin on it, and that's it, you know. So I think that it shows a commitment for the environment as well. We um, rely also on our collaborations with, within the PROTECT project. 
the human subject and sampling core. As I said, we did not start from scratch. We, they had already fostered partnerships with the participants, with the local community members, with the healthcare professionals. So when we got there, it was almost like they were waiting for us in that sense. So I think that was um, uh, it was very helpful. The research translation core, in addition to the communication tools to the CEC, it works with the RTC to support, protect, organize conferences in related specialty areas as this conference that we are having today. Um, this included organizing a session at the prenatal and postnatal risk to infant and child health at the fourth Puerto Rican public health conference and the sixth international conference of university engaged in health promotion in San Juan. And now we're working on doing presentations in the, in the fifth Puerto Rican um, uh, um, conference on uh, um, public health. And this is, this is a very um, uh, a big international conference. It's the biggest conference in public health that Puerto Rico has. It's hosted every two years, and we are hoping to, to capture more space within it every time. <clears throat> With the data, data management core, the sharing and modeling for report back process, and that is, you know, it's, it's because we're not, this information is not going back to other scientists, it's going back to the people where it came from. So the way we deliver it has to be in a way that is effective and that can help. We have uh, wor working with um, the training core, we've collaborated in a series of webinars and ethics, and these are webinars that are open to everyone that, well, um, from the Protect Projects and people that are on other of our um, um, uh, groups. And, um, and 215 webinars and careers in environmental health series. These are all hosted um, by Protect. With Project 4, this is Dr. Ingrid Padilla, the, and the human sampling card, we, we try to identify participants and well, well owners because a lot of them, like, like Akron says, are, are reluctant to you going in and, and, you know, and doing, testing their water and say, well, this water is no good, so what water are we going to use? And I have to refer back to this morning's presentation when, when um, uh, Katsi, Katsi was saying, well, we're going to move. We're going to move our people, but we, where, where are we going to move? We live in a very small group of islands. We have nowhere to move. So we really need to work on trying to clean up and prevent the, this, um, these exposures in, in other ways. Mm. <clears throat> Our trainees are also a very, a very important. We provide experiences for students within the, um, the universities of Puerto Rico. This is an um, experience that, that we had at the University of Puerto Rico Medical Sciences Campus. These are students from the doctorate program in um, um, environmental health and the doctorate program in social determinants of health, of which I am part of the faculty. Um, we had Dr. Monica Ramirez. Who was, she was part of our, our uh, um, protect, and now she is back in the University of Arizona. But at that time, she did a very, very interesting talk on citizen science. And we still have students very excited about that, so we're thinking of following up. We have our tr new trainees for the core, Colleen Murphy, this, she is right here with me now, it's a, an excellent student in the area of social determinants of health. And Marisol Padilla, she couldn't be with us, she is in the demography program. They're both um, involved in the work of PROTECT. We're working on groundwork for the report back. As I said, this is not just any report back. This is a report back that's the first time it's happening here. People don't even know what to expect. They're, they're more than anything, they're surprised at this. And, and of course, we're, we need to know what kind of information we have. We're so lucky to be working with Silent Spring. Uh, Julie Brody is here, and we are working with people that have so, so much experience in doing this, but still we have to uh, consult our participants and the people in these communities to see what is it that they want, how they want that information, how it will be delivered, and, you know, what we're and, and most important of all, what they're going to do with it, and if we can help them in, in any way. So right now we're going through a, a special study consisting of key informant interviews, and we're um, asking them about what they know about environmental health, what they want to know, how they want that information delivered, if they prefer it to be um, um, printed material, if they want it to be through um, um, electronic, because um, a lot of the, of the participants, and even though Puerto Rico is, uh, has most of the people living under the poverty uh, level, most people have cell phones. And cell phones can, can be a very good source of communication. People use a lot of texting. 
at home because the, you get you can get services where texting is unlimited. So you there is there are there are ways so that we can communicate so that this information gets to them and, um, and not just papers that they just throw away. Like I was interviewing one of the women, and she said, "Well, you know, don't, don't give me any more papers. I mean, you know, I'm not going to read this." So I think that it's important to talk to people and to know. One thing that they are very keen about is doing YouTube. Um, you know, who knew? You know, YouTube as a as a, a wonderful source of something that they can see whenever they want. Especially women that have so many things to do. You know, and there's a certain time of the day whenever it is that they have a little bit of time, they can, they can just just tune into this information and perhaps make it more um, valuable to them. We're meeting with our community advisory board to discuss these strategies. So it's wonderful because we can have uh, this um, um, two-way um, um, bi-directional communication, and we get we have our ideas, and they pre and we present it to them, and they say, well, if they tell us if they think it works or it doesn't, and we're getting ready to do a pilot version of the report back very very soon. Um, we also um, are part of the research the right to know. We have joined the um, Institute, um, Science Bay Institute Northeastern in Berkeley in this R1 project, Ethical and Legal Challenges in Communicating Individual Biomonitoring and per Personal Exposure Results to Study um, Participants, and it includes all these other institutions. We're, we are working on the report back. We're, we're um, doing different kinds of um, ideas, individual data, in the informed, informed consent, set expectations, what can the study say, the right to know or, or not to know, the written report, and as I say, the different forms to, to get that information for. And it's, it's really um, very important because it's, it's very scary. As I said, we have many contamination sites in Puerto Rico, but also we have a lot of contamination going into the homes of these people through products that they use. We go into the homes and we see, well, for example, we have this mosquito problem. So when they, when people use tons and tons of insecticide to protect themselves. And are they protecting themselves? You know, so, so there is such a potential for working. Every time I walk into one of these homes and I see all this plastic everywhere. And of course, every time I come to one of these conferences, I'm, I, 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 I leave so scared. You know? <laughs> Not only for them, for all of us. So I think there's a great potential for us to do work that's important. We're thinking of starting with a small number and, um, and, and phthalates, phenols, and parabens, and, and because these are the compounds that and people could more readily act upon to reduce exposures. And this is a, a sample of, of perhaps what a report back may look like. And this is thanks to the people from Silent Spring that are um, helping us with this, um, uh, developing these materials. We're working on new projects as well. We're, we're thinking about you know, workshops on research ethics and community-based participatory research for our community advisory boards. They are asking us for courses on environmental health because they want to be able to deliver this information and do prevention in the, in the communities that they work. Um, and also, as I said, um, educational materials to provide um, people when we visit them. We are in debt to all the women that have opened their homes and their lives to us. We're deeply committed to supporting them and learning about contamination and how um, they can make their own families safer and our families safer. These women that are there were participants of Protect and now they are working for us and in the project. So this is wonderful to have them as co-workers because they can provide us with information that is invaluable to us. I really need to think, uh, thank, thanks, um, <laughs> Phil, because to me, when I, when I started in this project, Jose said, do you want to do this? And I said, yeah. He said, and I said, who's going to do this with me? He said, Phil Brown. To me, it was like I was a singer, and they were saying, you want to sing with Ricky Martin? I said, yeah, <laughs> why not? <laughs> so I, 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 just, I just have to. <laughs> and I hope we'll see you in Puerto Rico November 2015 in the annual SRP conference. Thank you very much.